Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he to our services this morning here at Central. We appreciate very much your presence this morning and if you're a guest with us we encourage you to take a moment this time to fill out one of the white cards on the back of the pew in front of you and after you get that filled out please leave that laying in the seat and we'll be coming around to pick that up after we are dismissed this morning. We begin Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 o'clock for our morning worship service and then 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoons for evening service Wednesday, we have two Bible studies, one at 10 a.m. and then the other that evening at 6.30. So if you're able to be with us at any of those times, we appreciate it very, very much. At the close of the uh, service this morning, we'll have a few announcements to make, and then we'll be dismissed at the appropriate time. At this time, we'll enter into our worship service. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. To Christ be
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Angry words or let them never from the tongue unrivaled sin. They are hearts that simple sever, that perish so Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. <clears throat>
O wise and merciful Father, it is unto thee that we give all honor and glory as we've come into thy house to worship thee, the only true and living God. We're so thankful for every blessing that thou hast freely bestowed upon us as thy children. And we are grateful, dear Lord, that we can call upon thee as our Father, knowing that thou will hear our prayers and will answer them. We are grateful for this day, the first day of the week that we can come, that we can worship and serve and present those th gifts unto thee that thou hast desired of us. We ask thee to be with those that are sick, those that have been out for some time that are now back with us, we're truly grateful for. We're particularly in mind of Bill Mears, Donnie Blankenship, Heather Norton, that thou hast blessed them and uh, has giving them a good measure of health once again. And we pray that this will continue. Our Father, we're mindful of those that uh, have lost loved ones. Dear friend of mine, David Farr, who has given his life as a gospel preacher, has just passed away. And may thy richest comforts be upon his family and upon all others who have lost loved ones uh, as such. We thank thee, dear Lord, for this hour that uh, thou would be with us, that as we lift our voice in praise, that we'll be singing with meaning in our hearts unto thee of all that thou hast done for us. Bless James as he leads us in our songs. Bless David as he leads us in our, our lesson that will challenge our thinking, that we might be drawn closer to thee. In all that we say and do, dear Lord, we pray that we will always honor thee, the only true and living God. Continue to watch over us, bless us, but most of all, dear Lord, we ask for thy forgiveness, for we know that we are weak and frail and often do those things that we ought not and fail to do the things that we ought to do. Be with us, forgive us, in Christ's name, amen. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> oh, the death and the riches of God's saving grace, for we died from the cross for me.
form of our worship, one of the elements of worship. We bring back to remembrance of what our Christ did for us. Love so great that it went to the cross and suffered the shame and humiliation of the cross, the beatings. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Something we need to think about and bring into our minds as we partake of this. The bread which represents his body, so cruelly beaten for us. Nailed to the cross, his side pierced, shedding his blood again for us. That blood that we reach through baptism, cleansing us, that we can be freed from sin. If we walk in the light, we can enter heaven. We need to clear our minds of all worldly things. And think of our Christ and what he went through for us. Would you bow with me as we ask blessing upon the bread? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings we have in this life. We thank you for your love for us, that you gave your only begotten Son. And he so freely went to the cross for us, endured the pain and suffering he did for us. This bread which represents his body which is so cruelly beaten. We ask you to bless it and bless those who are about to partake. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all bow with me again, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your love and your Son's love for us, for the fruit of the vine which represents his blood, his blood which cleanses us from our sins. We ask you to bless it and bless those about to partake. This rest in Christ's name. Amen. With the Lord's Supper now being completed, we have an opportunity to give back, give to the church, to spread the gospel throughout the world. We pray with me, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the country that we live in, for the opportunities that we have, for the jobs that we have, able to make money, we know we were the stewards of these things. It all belongs to you. I ask you to bless those that freely give back to the, the work of the church, Lord, that we can spread the gospel, that we can bring those from the world into your church. I ask you to bless those about to give. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Rabel, we ask you please stand as we sing this next song. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. 
to Pride Month. You've probably seen rainbows everywhere. That's why I'm wearing this shirt and jacket. That's the closest thing I've got to a rainbow in my wardrobe. But I'm not going to preach about the sin of homosexuality or transgenderism. I'll just mention that I cannot imagine the hardness of heart, the audacity of spirit to not only participate in such a lifestyle, to make such a choice, but then to compound that by taking pride in it. Romans chapter 1, Paul explains that it is contrary to nature, it's contrary to God's will to live such a lifestyle But he concludes that chapter by saying, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. That's spiritual, eternal death. But the unrighteous, he describes in this chapter, not only do the same, but take pleasure in them that do them. They take pride in the sins that are contrary to nature, that are against God's will. And that's all I'll say about that. This morning, what we're going to talk about is pride. Is pride a sin? I suggest to you that pride is one of those gateway sins. Sometimes we talk about drug use and uh, marijuana being a a gateway drug. It just leads to harder drugs. We understand what that means. I think pride may be similar in a spiritual sense. Pride, we kind of downplay, kind of justify in our lives. It's kind of a pet sin, especially to us as American Christians. We try to 
to undermine the seriousness of pride. We have pride in our way of life. We have pride in our kids. And we try to justify it by saying, well, I don't mean that I'm saying that I think I'm better than anyone else or I think they're better than everyone else. But really, that's exactly what we are saying. And in Philippians chapter 2, and elsewhere throughout Scripture, Paul in Philippians chapter 2 tells us that we are to esteem others better than ourselves. That we are to look at others as better than me. But we justify and we explain away why it's okay for us, especially as Americans, to have pride in any area of our lives. It's not a big deal. It doesn't hurt anyone, but it hurts us. It hurts our relationship with our Father. And that's the danger of it. We take pride in so many things. Our kids, our jobs, our clothes, our riches, our wealth, our car, our boat, our sports teams. We take pride in our politics and we even take pride in our faith and our church. A proud Christian is an oxymoron. It's a contradiction of terms. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. And that's exactly what we need to strive to be doing as well. We're going to ask some questions about pride this morning. And I'm not going to apologize if this sermon runs a little long. I think it's something that we need to see and we need to look at what the Bible says about pride. A definition of pride is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction uh, derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. So with those thoughts in mind, the the first question I want us to ask about pride is, how do we become pride? Proudful. How do we become proud? How is pride acquired in our lives? Are we born with a sense of pride? Babies aren't proud. Babies are helpless. We're not born proud of ourselves. So how do we come in to possess this spirit? This spirit that we're better than others, that we're higher, that we're above, and people are below us. I think there's four different ways. You may be able to add some things to this, but I think you'll find that these things are are truth. We can have pride based upon our birth. Not that we're proud at birth, but based upon the conditions of our birth. And I know that there's a lot of discussion in our world about white privilege today and racial matters in our nation And in our time, it seems almost no better than they were 50 years ago. And I have to admit, there is a sense in which there is such a thing as white privilege. I have not had to deal with things in my life that others have because of the race that they were born as. There is such a thing. It shouldn't be a point of pride for us, but it is for some. Think about the Jews in Jesus' day. And even long before Jesus was born, they were proud of their race. They looked down upon especially the Samaritans, the ones who were so close to them geographically and so close to them religiously. They were proud of who they were and they looked down upon the Samaritans, considered them dogs. Rather than travel through Samaria, if they were going north from Israel, they would walk around the entire territory just so they didn't have to interact with them. Pride can be the result of one's birth. Pride can also be the result of things that we've accomplished, our own achievements. When we realize that we don't have any power or any blessings or any abilities beyond what God has given us, 
then there's no reason for us to be proud of what we have achieved. When we lord that over others, when we think of ourselves as better than other people because we've achieved something that they have not, that's the whole idea behind world records. I like to watch Dude Perfect. My kids love Dude Perfect on YouTube. Do you know who Dude Perfect is? They're this group of young men. They all went to college together about 15 years ago now back out in Texas. And now they do trick shots. They've shot basketball shots off of tall buildings. And they do all these crazy trick shots with different, in different sporting areas. And they have a lot of Guinness World Records. But that's really all it is. It's about achievements that no one else has done and being proud of those achievements. I'm better than someone else at this particular thing and that makes me feel special. Again, all of our talents and all of our abilities that help us to achieve anything in this life are given to us from God. We would be nothing without Him. We have no reason to elevate ourselves over others simply because of what we've achieved in life. But that is a sense of that is a source of pride. That is how we lift ourselves up. Also because of our possessions. Our possessions are a source of pride. I have something that no one else has. I want you to see what I have. What I have makes me better than you. And we flaunt it, whether it's clothes or cars, whatever it is. Our possessions easily become a source of pride for us. And this is the one thing I think, especially as Americans, that we struggle with. And we say, well, we're not, we're not trying to show off. Then what are we doing? Are we trying to help others? Are we trying to be a blessing? Are we trying to draw others closer to God by the things that we flaunt, by the things that we show off? Possessions can be a source of pride, but so can flattery. I think we can be flattered. We don't mind being flattered. And it's difficult sometimes to receive a sincere and and a true compliment. There's a difference between compliments and flattery, but... But flattery can intentionally lift up a person, can fill their head with hot air, sometimes we say. And flattery, when we hear things that we want to be true, when we hear people talk about us in glowing terms, about things that we have achieved or things that we do possess, it lifts us up with pride. We're proud of who we are. We're proud of what we've done. We're proud of what we have. And pride is a stumbling block. Pride is a gateway sin. But it's something that we think is not a big deal. We try to justify it, try to pretend like we're not guilty of it. So let's look at some passages that explain to us what the effects of pride are. This is not only the things that pride brings to us, but the things that pride demonstrates in our lives. And we've got a lot of verses to look at, and I hope that you've got your thumbs prepared. We'll spend most of our time in the books of Psalms and Proverbs, but the first passage we're going to look at is in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a chapter where David defeats Goliath. And what an inspiring story that is, this little boy, small in stature, against a giant. David was a young man and already knew what it was to be prideful, to be proud. We sometimes leave that out of this story. I think Joseph, in his revelation of his dreams to his Brothers also may have struggled with pride. Pride is something that young people especially are susceptible to. And it seems David may have had a touch of that here as he's come to visit his brethren who are in the army of Saul and are arrayed against the Philistines. Notice what David's brother Eliab says in verse 28. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. 
For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David wins a great victory for God on this occasion. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he won against Goliath because of the pride of his heart. But David ascended to a position over everyone else in the kingdom. Now he was a man after God's own heart. But, there, but he wasn't perfect as we know. And there may have been a touch here of pride in wanting to, to be there at the front. Wanting to see this thing. of Wanting to achieve something that no one else had or no one else could. But pride here, especially in youth, is associated with naughtiness of heart. Pride leads to so many other things. Looking down on others, the first, but then also a naughtiness. A desire to let them know, I'm better than you. To step on others. A desire to have what they have. To push them down even further. Pride is associated here with naughtiness of heart, whatever that might mean in each context. Next, let's go to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 10 first, and there are several psalms that deal more with pride than others. And we'll look here at verse 10 and then at verse 4. Psalm 10, verse 2, and then verse 4. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. The pride, a prideful persecute the poor. God has a special place in his heart, a soft spot for the poor, the widows, and the fatherless. David says here, the wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. How should we treat the poor? We should provide for them, serve them, minister to them the way that Jesus did. Jesus was poor in his own life and he served the poor and the needy around him. Verse 4 of Psalm 10 says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. He doesn't seek after God. A person who is prideful will be self-sufficient and believe, I don't need God. I can stand on my own two feet. What I've accomplished is because of my own power, my own might, my own wisdom. God is not in any of the thoughts of those who are proud. In Psalm 73, David describes pride as chains. What he's basically saying is, Pride enslaves us. When we get pride in our hearts, it's hard to get it out. Psalm 73, verse 6, Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a, gar as a garment. Pride weighs us down. It chains us. It enslaves us. We're serving ourselves, and it's hard to break that chain. It's hard for us to change our will. When we're proud of who we are, when we're serving self, it's hard to let that go, to humble ourselves, and to bow the knee to King Jesus. But that's exactly what we must do. Pride is a chain that enslaves us to ourselves. Psalm 119 the longest chapter, the longest psalm, and it's all about God's Word, but it has quite a bit to say about pride as well. We'll look at four verses, five verses here in Psalm 119, verse 51. says, The proud have had me greatly in division, in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. Pride derides. It brings down others. We think maybe we're lifting ourselves up when we have pride when really we're just trying to push others down. David says, the proud have put me down. They have had me greatly in derision. That's not what Jesus did. That's not how he lived his life. Psalm 119 verse 69. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. 
The proud aren't afraid to lie. A lie will come naturally. They'll say whatever they have to say, do whatever they have to do to keep themselves in that position of superiority. The proud have forged a lie against me, David says. Psalm 119, verse 78. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Really, if you think about it, only the proud can feel shame. Those who are humble and lowly can't be brought any lower. You can't make them feel ashamed because they're not trusting in themselves. They're not trusting in their own righteousness. They're trusting in God. And we think about Job in that sense. He wasn't proud of his righteousness. He was trusting in God through everything that he suffered. And he didn't have anything to be ashamed of because his trust was in God. But the proud can be made to feel shame for what they've said, for what they've done, for how they have treated the people around them. The proud will ultimately feel shame, especially on the day of judgment. Psalm 119, verse 85, The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. That's what they do. They want you to fall. The proud aren't interested in building up and encouraging and lifting up those around them. They dig pits for others to fall in. That makes them feel better, makes them feel like they're higher. But really, they've done themselves no good. They've just hurt other people. They dig pits for those around them. And then Psalm 119, verse 122. Be surety for thy servant for good. Let not the proud oppress me. That's what the proud do. They oppress. These are things that pride does. And these are things that pride will suffer. You think about all these verses we just looked at, especially in Psalm 119, as they apply to our Lord, as they apply to Jesus. Many of them seem even messianic in their expression and what Jesus went through, prophesying of what Jesus would suffer because of his humility. His enemies lied about him. They digged pits for him. They oppressed him. But still he maintained his humility. Imagine knowing you're the only begotten Son of God and not lording it over others, still being the most meek and humble and lowly person to have ever lived, knowing that you had all the wisdom and all the might of God at your disposal and still going before your oppressors without saying a word, as a lamb is dumb, was led to the slaughter, Jesus opened not his mouth. Because he was humble. Pride will not be quiet. Pride will not suffer silently. Pride will try to bring others down. Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord be high, he hath respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. There's a great distance between the proud, and God. He's not close to them. The proud have separated themselves, not only from those around them, but from God Himself. Many times they don't realize it, but that's what pride does. It makes you inaccessible, unaccessible to God. He will not draw close to you. Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you, but that requires a great deal of humility. Now let's move to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Back in chapter 6 of Proverbs, Solomon says, There were six things that the Lord hates. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And the very first one is a proud look. God hates pride. To know that you are the recipient you are the object of God's hatred should cause us to humble our hearts Proverbs 13 verse 10 I know this reads a little differently maybe in some of the more modern versions but I prefer here the King James Version Proverbs 13 verse 10 
only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. What Solomon's saying here is that all conflict, all contention in the history of humanity is a result of pride. Someone thinking, my way is better than yours. Only by pride cometh contention. Contention is the result of pride. Pride always leads to some sort of conflict, some sort of contention. And we want to live peaceful lives. Jesus offers us a peace that passes understanding, but it cannot come through pride. Proverbs 15, verse 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but He will establish the border of the widow. God's going to destroy the house of those who live their lives full of pride in their own accomplishments and in who they are. It cannot be avoided. Ultimately, God will destroy them. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Even if you find people who will flatter you and hold your hands and tell you, yes, you're great, you have something to be proud of, we have nowhere to stand in comparison to God. He is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 16, verses 18 and 19. This is the verse that probably first comes to mind for most of us when we think about pride. We usually apply it on a higher scale, on a more national scale. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the, uh, before the fall. Verse 19 is connected with it but doesn't mention, uh, well, it mentions pride. Better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. The idea is that it's better to be humble. If Verse 18 tells us that pride leads to destruction. It's preferable then to be lowly, to be humble, because we don't worry about, we don't have to face that destruction, falling on our faces. That's not something that we're ever concerned with because our heart is humble before God. Proverbs 21 verse 4 settles the matter and answers the question for us. A high look, a proud heart, the plowing of the wicked is sin. Pride is a sin. There's no way to sugarcoat it. There's no way to cover it up. There's no way to explain it away. Pride is sin. Whatever we have pride in, we must put that out of our hearts. We must humble ourselves before God. He will bring us down. He will humble us. He will cause us to fall flat. He will show us that pride is an abomination in his eyes. Proverbs 28, verse 25. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. That is, he'll be blessed by God, but it's only through humility. The pride stir up strife. Instead of promoting peace in the lives and the hearts of those around them, the people that they care for, they simply make things worse. They stir up strife intentionally or not. But it's a result of pride. That strife that's stirred up is contention that's brought on by strife. I wanted to end there, but I couldn't just let the three columns be unequal, so I had to add one more verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. And this ties in to the song that we sang this morning, Angry Words, Oh, Let Them Never. There is a connection between pride and anger. There always will be. Solomon says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. To be patient is to be better than pride. And that means if we're proud, it's hard to be patient. Sometimes we pray for patience and we say, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. That's pride speaking. It really is. I want what I want. I know what I'm dealing with and I need you to help me with it, but I want it the way I want it. But in verse 9, he says, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. 
Our spirit can be proud, and proud leads to, pride leads to contention. And there's always that connection then between pride and anger. Angry words are a result of pride in our hearts. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. There are no passages that speak positively about pride. There's no way to say it except that pride is sin. God hates a proud look. It is contrary to the nature of God and the nature of Jesus Christ, His life, to think of ourselves in any area or in any way as better than anyone else. We must have humility of heart. So, to kind of come to the question, and I know maybe this is something that, that you'll say, well, it's just different. That's not the way I feel in my heart. That's not what I'm dealing with. When I say I'm proud, I don't mean it that way. Is there such a thing as good pride? I can't imagine that there is for several reasons. First of all, as we mentioned, pride is never referred to in a positive way in Scripture. I cannot find one verse where God says He's proud, where someone says they're proud of another person, and that's a good thing, that's acceptable, that's righteous in the eyes of God. I can't find that in Scripture. I suggest to you that when we say we're proud of others, we're really proud of our influence upon them. When we have pride in someone else, we're really expressing pride in our own self. I know that we're proud of our kids when they accomplish something, like winning a tournament at Little League, but our pride gets the better of us in those situations when we yell at the umpires, when we get in fights with other parents. This is what our country's full of. Maybe you say, well, I've never done those things. I don't do those things. But our pride in their accomplishments is still there. Now, I'm not saying that we have to not participate in these things. But we have to be careful in how we celebrate them. We do have to be careful in how we lord their victories over others pride in others is indeed pride in the way that we have influenced them and the effect that we've had on their lives i suggest to you it's better for us to it's more scriptural even for us to say that we're well pleased when we say that we're proud of our kids i think that's really what we mean i'm well pleased in them and when it comes to being well pleased I hope we'll find that that helps us to think more spiritually about our children, not taking pride in their physical accomplishments and what they achieve in life, but being well pleased in who they are in their relationship and their faith towards God. This is the way God expressed His feelings towards Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'm proud of you. Even though God has every right to have pride, and he's a jealous God. There is no one equal with him on his level. But God said about his only begotten son, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At his baptism in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 12, it's a quotation from uh, Isaiah, I believe. And then in Matthew chapter 17 at the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter and James and John were there, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he added, hear ye him. He is superior to Moses and Elijah, to the law and the prophets. But God didn't say, I'm proud of him. He said, I'm well pleased in him. And in Hebrews chapter 13, the writer of Hebrews there says that when we bring these sacrifices, the sacrifices of worship to God, with the heart that he desires, in sincerity and in truth. The writer of Hebrews says, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. God is well pleased with us when we do the right thing, when we're obedient to him, when we bow the knee, when we're humble. God's well pleased with us. And that's a better way for us to express ourselves. And again, I want to make this very clear. I'm not suggesting to you that it's a sin when you say... I'm proud of so-and-so. Words change meanings. I understand that. We began by talking about those who are gay. 
This is the month of pride in that way of life. And the word gay has changed its meaning from the time that the King James Version was translated until today. And the word pride, maybe it has changed its meaning in that sense as well. But a more biblical way to express, I think, what we're saying might be to say that we're well pleased. I hope that that makes us and causes us to think about spiritual things first rather than our physical and material possessions and accomplishments. Is there good pride? Not in Scripture there's not. But again, words may change their meaning over time. So the final question we're going to ask is, how do we deal with this? How do we overcome it? How do we remove it from our hearts? If we know this is something that we struggle with as Americans or as members of the Church of Christ, how do we get over it? Sometimes it's just as simple as that. There are numerous passages, not just James 4 verse 10, 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, but it, there are other passages where it's simply a command, humble yourselves. Take a dose of humility. Sometimes it's just a matter of saying, I will think better of others than I do of myself. It's just that simple. We have to sometimes just humble ourselves. The best way to do that, I suggest to you, is to study the life of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 explains how Jesus had equality with God. But he didn't consider that something to be held on to, to be grasped, to be retained for eternity. Jesus gave up much of who he was as God to be born like us. But he was the only begotten Son of God. He was God in human form. He was God in the flesh. And as such, he was able to live sinlessly. But he did not have pride in his heart as the Son of God, as the rightful King of Israel. He humbly served the downtrodden, the brokenhearted, the poor and the needy in his communities. He served and he lived his life as a carpenter. A simple craftsman, he did not lift himself up at any point. He did not say, look at me, I'm better than you. He wanted everyone around him to know that they were children of God. That they were worthy. He wanted them to feel better than him. Study the life of Jesus. If you know that you're struggling with pride, if this is something that you want to change about your spirit, about your heart. Study Jesus' humility. Get involved in service to others. John chapter 13 is the perfect example of this. Where Jesus, the night before his betrayal, he knows what's about to happen to him. He's just resurrected Lazarus from the dead and that has set in in order a, a sequence of events that will ultimately lead to his crucifixion. In chapter 13, Jesus gets down and he washes his disciples' feet. The the act of service that was reserved for the lowest servant in the household. And Peter, of course, says, not going to do it. Not going to let you wash my feet. You're my master. I should be serving you. Peter had his own pride that he had to deal with. But Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And that's what he's saying to us. If we don't serve others, we're nothing like Jesus Christ. If we don't have a humility of heart, we have no part with him. If you need humility, get involved in Food kitchens. Get involved in service. Not for the recognition that it brings you, but for the joy it brings others. If that's what you need to do, get involved. Serve others. If you struggle with pride, force quietness into your life. So many times our pride speaks before it thinks. Our pride says things that get us into trouble. 
We don't have to be right all the time. Pride says I do. Pride says when I've got the truth, when I've got what's right, I want other people to know it. Humility can say God is right whether I am or not. Humility can say even if I don't express myself in this situation, I can trust that God's way is still right. Force yourself not to speak in those situations even when you know you have the upper hand. That will teach you humility. Jesus, before Pilate, was asked numerous questions. There was one that could have changed the course of history. When Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate asked him, Where are you from? What is your place of birth is what Pilate was asking. Jesus was known as the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. It was assumed by the Jews, by the Pharisees, by his opponents that Jesus was born in Nazareth. Pilate had other suspicions, I believe. The prophets foretold that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem and Jewish records would have confirmed it. Pilate asked Jesus, where are you from? And Jesus, if he answered, would have answered truthfully. He would have had to say, I was born in Bethlehem. And who knows whether Pilate, learning that, would have halted the course of what was taking place. But Jesus knew what he had to do. He had the truth. He had a right answer. He could have escaped from the situation. But without his sacrifice, humanity would have been lost. Jesus forced quietness into his life in that moment. Even when he had the truth. Even, he, even when he had right on his side. Because he was humble in his heart. And sometimes... In order to learn humility in our lives, we have to lose on purpose. I love sports. I love to play sports. I love to see other people excel and experience victory in sports. I love to go to camp. And we play sports at the camp that I grew up at, Indian Creek Youth Camp up in Walker County. And sports are important at that camp. And when we get competitive, I like to be the one who puts those proud athletes in their places. Maybe I have a little pride in that. But sometimes it's even more enjoyable to see those little ones, to see those who aren't as good at sports on other, in other situations. Sometimes it's even better to see them succeed. And sometimes maybe our team loses on purpose just so others can experience that victory, so that they can be lifted up and built up. I know my ability. I know what God has granted me the talent to do. So what harm is there in losing on purpose? Now, we don't like to feel that way when it comes to Alabama versus Auburn. But those things do not matter. Whether we win a ball game, or whether we lose in our jobs. What matters is how we serve those around us, how we help them to see Jesus in us. Sometimes to learn humility, we have to force ourselves to be quiet, and we have to strive even to lose on purpose. Again, Jesus did the same. Jesus lived a life that was sinlessly perfect there was no guile found in his mouth. He didn't hate his enemies. He loved everyone. He wanted what was best for them. He did not deserve to be scourged and crucified. But he lost on purpose. Because of the humility of his heart. So that we could be in heaven in eternity with him. Pride is a sin. Pride is connected to so many other sins in Scripture. Pride is something we need to struggle and strive against in our lives. There are ways to remove it, to be humbled, to be lowly in spirit. There's ways for us to learn not to be proud anymore. 
But we must look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus gave us a path to perfect humility. He gave us a path to forgiveness of our pride. He told us that we must repent of our sins. Faith is necessary in order to be saved. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but then we must change who we are. We must repent of pride, repent of every sin. We must humble ourselves in order to be saved. Once we've made that choice, that change in our lives, we confess Jesus Christ. We can be baptized. Baptism is a humble act. It is not something that we do ourselves. It's not something that any man decided was necessary for salvation, but it is God's expression of our submission to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In humility, we allow someone else to submerge us in the waters of baptism. We come up a new creature, our sins are washed away. I I say that baptism is an act of humility because I've seen people, I've baptized people who had a fear of water. And it was very difficult for them to let go of the edge of the baptistry And I had to pull their hands loose and tuck them under. It's an act of humility to submit to someone else doing that to you. But baptism is that expression that my life has changed. I'm putting pride away. I'm going to live a humble life like Jesus did so that he can save me in the end. If you need to make that choice this morning, we encourage you to do so. In humility, come forward. If you have sins in your life that need to be forgiven as a child of God. It takes a great deal of humility to confess those sins. But that's what we're here for, to lift you up, to encourage you, not to lord over you, to make you feel worse, not to show that we're proud that we haven't done what you've done, but to walk with you together as we struggle daily. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, won't you come forward as we stand and sing. Just, uh, well, I had, I had a uh, sheet up here. I think David hit it. <laughs> That's all. No, no, it's fine. That's fine. Uh, just, uh, just a couple of things that, um, that we wanted to make mention of. In the bulletin, we need to make a correction on the uh, supper, I believe it is, Dave, on the supper. And that is that it will be July 1st and not July the 8th. This is, a, there, is there are two sign-up sheets in the back on the table in the foyer. And that is to uh, sign up if you're coming. And then the other sheet is for the men to sign up, I believe, for what they're bringing. Is that correct? Okay. And so uh, if you or have plans for July the 1st, uh, then uh, or don't have plans but would like to come and and have a fellowship meal here at the building, then please uh, be here. I believe it's at 5 o'clock is when we'll be eating. And, and so that, uh, and we want to do that uh, right on the money. So 
Uh, please make your plans to be here uh, that day, and then that way we can have some good fellowship and, and enjoy one another throughout the, um, throughout the evening. Uh, at this time, we'll uh, turn it over to the elders. Uh, if they have an announcement they'd like to make. In 1 Timothy 3, 1, Paul said, If a man desireth the work of a bishop, he desireth a good work, a good thing. Several months ago, James served the congregation here at Central as an elder, but due to some circumstances that he was faced with, he needed to step away for a while. And uh, having been completed, the elders approached him and asked if he would reconsider serving again. And he has consented to do that. So uh, we are appreciative of his attitude, his willingness, and uh, what he's been able to accomplish while he did serve as an elder, and we look forward to that uh, again. So James, if you would uh, come up, please. We welcome you, and we look forward to working with you as a member here. I would be uh, wrong in saying that I'm proud to do this based upon, based upon David's lesson this morning. But I am, I am truly humbled. And I don't know how true the story, the story is, but I believe that one of our presidents uh, was a member of the Lord's Church and served as an elder in the congregation before he became president. And he told the American people, he said, I regret that I am resigning from the highest position ever bestowed upon man, and that is serving as an elder. It truly is the highest position any man could ever hold to serve in the Lord's church. And that service is commended uh, by the uh, willingness of the, shep the uh, sheep to be able to follow the shepherds. We have uh, four great men here at Central, and I am uh, deeply moved to be able to work with them and to be able to help this congregation, and I pray that that our, our working together will be beneficial to each and every one of us. Doug told me to keep it short because we're hungry, we're ready to go, and so that's, that's what we'll do. And uh, I told him, I said, well, if you give me an opportunity to talk, I'm going to preach to you. He said, no, don't do that. And I said, I won't. But anyway, I, I am truly humble. David, thank you for the lesson this morning. It, it is a... It is a struggle for humanity to not put pride above things. And, and it's a great lesson and a great reminder for us to be able to uh, know that what God's word says. Uh, I don't have anything else. Do y'all have something? Okay. Richard, if you'll make your way up and dismiss us, please. Thank you. Let us stand. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity we've had to come out and study a portion of thy word and sing praises in their wonderful name. We pray that, dear Heavenly Father, that our worship was pleasing to thee. We ask you to be with us as we depart, and we ask you to continue. We lift up our elders to you, dear Heavenly Father, as they do the will for you at the church here at Central, and that we get out to the community and serve others and bring them back to thee before it's too late. We continue to Forgive us when we fail in Christ's name. Amen.